getting those. All right, now if you're, if you're seated and you've got your notebook, take it, take it and open it up with me just to the very front, to the very front. Don't, don't leaf through it, right? I know I have to always, you know, as a professor, when you hand out materials, you lose people because they all run through it all. Right, I'm asking you for a little self-control, a little self-restraint, right? Uh, all I want you to look at is at the yellow sheet that's there, or goldenrod, or something like that, whatever it is. The reason why I want to make you aware of that, you'll notice on there that it gives you the overview of the fall of the passages we're going to study. So hopefully, we'll make it up through chapter 4 in the fall, and so you'll be studying in your own uh, study through the week through chapter 4. That's one of the major divisions within the book of Romans. So we hope to get through chapter 4, then we're going to take a little break through Thanksgiving and Christmas and have a little bit of a Christmas focus and Thanksgiving focus there. Then we'll return to Romans in January, okay? So that. Then you'll also notice that you see key verses that are there. We're going to try to memorize as a church, and I don't know if you can just rotate your head here for a moment without standing up, and you can see on the back wall, these are the verses that we're going to be memorizing as a congregation. So the key verses, the Romans Road, some of you have heard of that. It's a, often a, a way to present the gospel uh, of the fact that all have fallen short of what God requires because we're all broken. We were singing that song, Stronger. Um, one of the key truths of the book of Romans is because what Jesus has done, we don't have to sin. We can. We can choose to, but we've been freed, all right? And so uh, the issue here is we're going to talk about, well, where were we? Well, we were in bondage to our sin. We were willing rebels against God. Well, what did God do in Christ? Well, that's what happens here. What did God provide for us, eternal life? How do you access that gift by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ? So we're going to memorize the ones you see there, key verses on the left. But we've also put some secondary verses. If you want to memorize more or you want to do something in your family at home or one verse in particular is really, really important for you to remember uh, because of just where you are in life or what's happened to you in life, uh, maybe you need to commit that to memory and put it on your uh, uh, mirror when you get up in the morning and look at it, right? So it's better than looking at your face in the mirror. Look at the... uh, uh, verse or you put it on your car dash or you put it somewhere where you don't forget it because it's a truth that you have a hard time holding on to. Maybe you need to do that. So that's what's on that left hand side. Now you get a little note from the elders so you're, flat, you're working through with me. You get a little note from the elders. You can read that later uh, in terms of that. Then you get an introduction to the study of the book of Romans. We're actually going to do the introduction today. in in the sermon today, and I give you a pretty full outline of the book of Romans. This is not inspired, uh, it's just Kowser-esque, whatever that is, right? So I've studied the book of Romans over the time, and I've tried to lay out the line of thought that Paul is making an argument through the book of Romans. He is making uh, an initial statement. He's going to declare the good news of God, and he's going to begin why we need good news how we access and become a part of that good news, what happens to us when we believe that good news. He's going to deal with some problems that people have raised because of the Jews not accepting that good news and that raises questions in the minds of some about God's faithfulness in 9, 10, and 11. Then he's going to come back in chapter 12 and say, in light of all this good news of what God has done in view of all of his mercies, what kind of people are we and what kind of people should we be? That's what he's going to talk about. So I want you to be familiar with that because we're just going to be in the very first move of Paul's argument, which is really uh, the whole idea about why we need God's intervention in Christ. I mean, one of the the fundamental, if you study in the history of the church, you've heard this statement about the seven deadly sins. Anybody ever heard that, seven deadly sins? Okay, it's been mocked and pilloried. I think there's a lot of wisdom in it. But you know what the cardinal or the chief sin is that stands at the top of the seven deadly sins? Pride. And pride is the fundamental problem of the human condition that we think that we can deliver ourselves from the things that threaten us. We think that we can save ourselves. We think that we can bring purpose and meaning. Or we can find somebody on TikTok who can tell us. We think we can deliver ourselves. The very first thing that you need as a human being is to recognize is that you're fundamentally 
broken and estranged from the God who made you, and you need him to deliver you because you can't deliver yourself. Right? And that's where we're going to begin as we talk about it as we get underway. Now, flip forward one more, and you're going to get the notes for today if you've got your notebook. So you'll want to have this open because I'm going to work through those notes today, and you can fill in the blanks to go along. You know, I hope you're a messy note taker. Some of you I know, it's just your obsessive compulsive thing. It's just you like to print it exactly, and if you make a mistake, it's horrible, right? I, I, I understand that. I, I understand that feeling. But I, but I hope you'll just, you, you'll fill in the blanks, but I hope you'll write in the margins. I hope you'll make a note somewhere because what's going to happen to you is this is as you study the scriptures all together. Uh, I'm going to be teaching and preaching, but you may get stuck on a point that I didn't even know was really going to resonate with you today because the Spirit of God has that point for you. It's a reminder. It's a challenge. It's a warning. I don't know what it will be, but you want to be ready to mark it down. You want to be able to return to it. You want to think about it a little bit more. Okay. Now, the one last thing, and I'll mention this again next week as well. If you flip past over those two pages, you'll come and it says week of Monday, August 29. That's the first one, Romans 1, 1 to 7. So between this Sunday and really two Sundays from now, you should be studying Romans 1, 1 to 7. And you're just going to spend one day, and, and if you read the introductory material, I suggest you take one day and read it and just make observations. What's in it? Make notes to yourself. Second day, you try to summarize, you know, if I were to try to, somebody ask me, what's the big idea in Romans 1, 1 to 7? Try to put it down in a sentence or two. What is he really talking about? Okay. And then the next one is you say, well, if these are true and this is what Paul is saying, then uh, so what? And you try to say, well, what, what does it mean for me? How should it change the way I think, the way I live, uh, what I understand about God, right? Apply it. And then we, we've got a category in there about sharing it. This is where our one another group comes in. This is where you at work or you with your neighbors or you and your family members, something that you're going to write down that you're going to share with someone, right? And sometimes it could be with another brother. The sharing could be, I was reading this and I didn't understand this. What do you think Paul was trying to say? Or the share could see, I was really blessed by the fact that thinking about Christ and his resurrection, that the Spirit of God authenticated his identity as the Son of God, as the appointed Davidic king to come to fulfill all of God's promises. That just so blessed me and reminded me of God's faithfulness. And you just want to share it with somebody, right? Whatever it is that you want to do, you're going to put something down. And the goal, of course, is is that scripture is always intended not merely to inform you. It's not about filling you with a bunch of theological knowledge. It's meant to transform you and how you think and live and what you love ultimately, deeply, right? And then also, it's, it's meant to go through you as you eat scripture, as you partake of it. It changes and transforms you, and then it calls you out to people. That is what God does. Okay? And what we're going to see as we read through the book of Romans, we're going to begin with a group of people who are absolutely hopeless, and we're going to wind up in chapter 14 with, with Paul calling them with the power of God now by the Spirit because you have been transformed, accept one another in love. So everything is driving us to be, if things get right here, then things get right here. When things are broken here, they're broken here. That's what he's going to get after. So what's going to make you love your neighbor, even want to love your neighbor, let alone know how to love your neighbor, it's because you're going to be transformed to have the heart and mind of Jesus, right? So that's where we're heading. So that'll help you, uh, and then you'll see next time there's a place for you to take sermon notes if you just take them there, uh, but also we'll provide some sermon notes to go along with that, okay? All right. Now, if I was in class, I'd ask for questions. Does anybody have any immediate questions about that? Please don't say, I don't know anything that you just said. That's very discouraging uh, in terms of that. All right, well, take a look at that. If you have any, please feel free to come uh, and chat with me or chat with one of the elders uh, about that. We'd be glad to, to help you. Uh, by the way, if you're new here and you're trying to say, well, who are the pastors? Who are the elders? Uh, we do have mug shots out there that come out of the, the, uh, you know, the post office, local post office. We just copied them and put them up there. No. The, the, but we're there. You can also see the Women's Discipleship Council, the ladies that we have uh, uh, in, uh, uh, approved and put into positions of leadership to work in discipling our ladies. 
And so, ladies, if you're trying to figure out, well, who's the movers and shakers in that area there, if you want to see who the deacons are, they're out there too. Uh, so, you know, take a look at them so you can recognize them uh, and uh, get connected if you need to. Okay. All right. Well, let's turn to uh, Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. And somebody say, well, I thought we were going to study Romans. Why not Romans 1? Well, I hope I'll make a case here in just a moment. When you study any book in Paul, this is a, the, one of the things here, is that there's a reason that it's a book. A book is, is something that has a, uh, something that holds it together. So Paul's books are not like bags of marbles, right? Like a bag of marbles is you just have this bag and I got a red marble and a clear marble and a you know, cat eye marble and things like that. What's the connection to them? They're all marbles, but there's no, there's no argument. There's no progression in what's happening. Well, Paul, it's very clear when he writes his letters, he knows the end from the beginning. He's working toward a conclusion and he builds on his way across, right? And so one of the things that's important about that is when you drop in, one of the things that we often do, especially in our tradition in the West, is we, we like to cherry pick from the Bible, right, through a verse app or through a favorite verse. And I would rather have people cherry picking from the Bible than cherry picking from TikTok. Amen to that, right? I'd rather you do that. But at the same time, sometimes it, lets, it drops us in, in the middle of something that we don't know what came before and what came after, and we can distort what we're reading. And there's so many famous incidences about that, right? One of the most famous ones, of course, in Paul is, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so it's put up in locker rooms for games. I'm going to win this game, right? I can survive this teacher. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Right, I can get an A in this class, when, whatever it is. Right? So you put a little moniker over thing, and then you read it, and you realize that Paul talks about, well, whether I'm successful, flourishing, or whether things are really going bad, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So one is not necessarily tied to victory as people would see it in the secular world. Matter of fact, you could be in prison and still be saying, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so that seems to be, I can hold on to by God's grace and be faithful to and endure with hope and purpose and stay on mission no matter what the circumstances of my life are. That's a power that will sustain me. Has nothing to do, I may be in prison, I may die and, uh, uh, as Paul did, right, and have his head removed by the Romans. But I can be faithful to Christ and know his joy and serve him no matter what the circumstances, okay? So we want to make sure we don't do that in Romans. We don't want to. So even in the Romans road, as you're memorizing, hopefully you'll be able to put it back in the argument of the book of Romans and understand where it sets as we work our way through. The second thing is, is that Paul is writing to a group of people. And this is one thing that seems odd with the book of Romans, because some people think the book of Romans is just like a little theology, you know, like a theology text dropped in there. And it's written for all Christians, but no Christians in particular. But as you read the book of Romans, it's very clear that Paul has particular issues in mind. Matter of fact, we're going to we're going to use an illustration. He has trifocals on. He has three things he's concerned about, three major uh, areas of concern. And he's got all of those swirling around, and he's going to bring, and this is the, the amazing, he's going to bring the full weight of the gospel, the full weight of what God has done, is doing, and will do in Jesus Christ by the power of the Spirit to restore and reclaim everything. He's going to bring that whole story, the story of how God literally has moved heaven and earth to create a new people, to have a new kind of community and a new kind of mission. He's going to tell that story. And so he's going to bring it to bear on a church that is having a struggle to get along along ethnic lines. Jews and Gentiles are at each other's throats in Rome. It just so happens that Paul is afraid that Jews and Gentiles are going to be at each other's throats in Jerusalem too. There's all kinds of things that are going on. So that to understand the case, one of the things is we interpret a letter in Paul, we want to see it. It should make sense of Paul addressing that circumstance. And so there's a lot in the book of Romans about what it means to be the people of God, about what kind of community we would be and should be. And it's going to say, it's going to make one of the arguments, it's as important, right, what we say about God's good news, 
about what God did in Christ. It's important that we say that right. It's important that we give the right good news or it becomes bad news. You can't save yourself. That's God's good news. All right, God did something in Jesus to make it happen. He went to the cross. He died in your place. He provided a way for you to come out underneath God's just penalty for your sin if you believe on him. Well, what do I do? I have to have faith. Well, I trust in him. What's he do? He gives you a new life. He frees you. He fills you with the spirit. That's the message, right? So we got to get the good news right. But what Paul wants to say is the way we live as a church is a part of that message. And we can be a people who undermine the power of the message because we're a contrary witness to what Jesus died to create. So he's going to go after that and get after us as a community. Okay, now with those, let's take a look and work our way through. So we study Paul's letters, and I bring some things here. Uh, We don't have actual pictures of these figures, right? We don't have an actual picture of Paul, uh, or the lady in the middle there is a woman by the name of Phoebe, and I'll describe that here for you in a moment. But uh, we don't have an actual statement of here. But one thing we know, this is a picture that's trying to commemorate the one on the left over here. I don't know if I have a a little uh, laser beam here. There we go, right here. Picture right here. Uh, This is a picture of Paul quoting to uh, the individual by the name of Tertius. We know that this letter was quoted to Tertius. He's called an amanuensis. You can actually employ them. Here's a, a Christian man. We know Tertius is a Christian man. But he said in there, Paul is dictating this letter to him. And we know that because when you get to chapter 16, right in the middle of Paul's greetings, he says, I, Tertius, who wrote this letter, greet you in the Lord, right? So we know Tertius is there, so Paul is doing that. Right there at at the beginning of chapter 16, we find out that a woman by the name of Phoebe, a servant or deacon, we'll talk more about that when we get there, from the church in Cenchrea, which is up in Macedonia around where Corinth is, She was actually the one who brought the book of Romans to Rome. And Paul says, you need to receive her. You need to take care of her. It's very likely that she was a wealthy woman who was one of the patrons of Paul, not in a formal sense, but someone who helped him financially and materially. Well, she delivers this book of Romans to the Romans. And then we find out that as we're reading that Paul makes a big deal about the fact, remember, Peter, okay, this is some Bible stuff. Peter was the apostle to the, who? Peter, apostle to the Jews, right? Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles, right? Now, I just want to say here, right, in the biblical world, there's just two types of people, okay, in terms of ethnic groups. There's Gentiles and Jews, Right? which is a very Jewish-centric way of describing the world. There's the Jews and everybody else, okay, in terms of that. And among those Gentiles is all the different flavors, right, of different people all around the world in terms of that. But Paul is saying, I am an apostle to the Gentiles by God's direct call through Jesus Christ. Okay? And as we work our way through, he's addressing house churches in Rome. Okay? There are no church buildings at this period of time. And we know they're struggling over Jew-Gentile issues because he spends chapter 14 and the first half of chapter 15 going after that issue. Also in chapter 11, he smacks the Gentiles around a little bit. Okay, Kind of takes them to the woodshed. And he mentions his authority as the apostle to the Gentiles right in chapter 1, verses 1 to 7. So he's dealing with Jew-Gentile tensions, and we don't talk about that. Okay, so the situation. Now, without any further ado, let's read chapter 15. Come to chapter 15, and let's read beginning uh, in verse 14, if you're there with me. And so this is the, right after he's finished the body of his argument, he's going to talk about his circumstances and the reason why he wrote this letter. Okay, so one of the things we want to pay attention to, this is what Paul was trying to accomplish. We want to read it in light of what he was trying to do. So here's what he says. I myself am convinced, my brothers and sisters, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with knowledge, and competent to instruct one another, right? Now here, I just want to say, I don't think Paul's blowing smoke. I don't think he's trying to say, you know, two nice things before you say one bad thing. That's not what he's trying to say. He's speaking to a group of people. If you read chapter 16, there's a lot of mature Christians here. And he doesn't, he's not writing to a bunch of babes in Christ, 
But also you find out that just because you may have some maturity in Christ, it doesn't mean that you might have some real brokenness in your understanding of what it means to be a follower of Christ. Because this isn't a new church, but it's got problems, serious problems, okay? But he's recognizing that, that there's some maturity here. Yet I have written you quite boldly on some points to remind you of them again because of the grace God gave me. Right? My authority to address you is not based on the fact of my identity as a Jew or the fact that I came to Christ earlier, that I was older than you. No, by God's authority as the one who's appointed by God's grace, which for Paul, everything for him was about grace. He didn't deserve anything. He didn't earn it. It wasn't because he was such a great guy. God said, Paul, I want you on my team. No, Paul was an, a, a rebel and an opponent, and he was killing Christians, and God rescued him. So by grace... Um, to be a minister of Christ to the Gentiles. He gave me the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God, okay, this good news, gospel, this good news that is, and this is a hard, it's both from God, he's the author of it, but it's also about him, okay? So he's the subject and the author of this message, because God is the one who is stepping in to not only make it possible to have some good news when we're broken and sinful and worthy of judgment, but he's the one that enacts the good news. He makes it good news, right? So the gospel of God, so that the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, I glory in Christ Jesus and my service to God. I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God by what I have said and done, by the power of signs and wonders through the power of the Spirit of God. The authenticating marks of one of the original apostles is that they had supernatural ability that authenticated them as the representatives of Jesus. A unique one-off position in God's salvation history and his development of his saving work. Uh, so from Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of God. It has always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known so that I would not build, be building on someone else's foundation. Rather, as it is written, those who are not told about him will see and those who, will not, who have not heard will understand. This is why I have often been hindered from coming to you. Now, if we had time, we don't this morning to go back to chapter 1. He immediately begins in chapter 1 saying, I wanted to come to you guys many, many times, but I couldn't. And the reason Paul didn't come is because he had more pioneering gospel work to do. And we're going to find that when he looks at this, the church at Rome, he doesn't see them as a church that, that needs him as an evangelist. They need him as an apostle to grow them and deepen their faith. But he's going to go past them onto Spain to unreached areas. But now, verse 23, that there is no more place for me to work in these regions, and since I have been longing for many years to visit you, I plan to do so when I go to Spain. I, 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 I want to go to Spain because I understand there's some really cool places to put, and I need my Instagram account to get a few more hits. I hope to see you while passing through and to have you assist me on my journey there after I have enjoyed your company for a while. Now, however, I am on my way to Jerusalem in the service of the Lord, Lord's people, therefore, Macedonia and Achaia were pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the Lord's people in Jerusalem. We're going to talk about that. He's taking up a collection for famine relief for people who are starving in Judea. And he's taking it up primarily from Gentiles to give to primarily Jews. Verse 27, they were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. Notice this one, for it for if the Gentiles have shared in the Jews' spiritual blessings, they owe it to the Jews to share with them their material blessings. One of the part of the argument by now is we find out the good news for uh, all the Gentiles in here, which is vast majority of you, right? Some of there may be some Jews here, Jewish heritage, but almost everybody's Gentile in here. We can't go back to to Jacob. We got one of the tribes of Israel. We don't tra trace that lineage. And we have become sons and daughters of Father Abraham, right? Father Abraham had many sons. If you've been around Christian circles for a while, you've heard that one, right? 
but the idea, well, what is it, why do we even describe Christians that way? Because the good news that we get to participate in, the blessings that we get to enjoy as Christians who are Gentiles, are the blessings that were promised to the world through Abraham. And who is Abraham? The father of the Jews. So we today have who come to know Jesus Christ by faith, we are participating in the blessings that have come through the Jews. The preeminent Jew is Jesus, the Messiah. And so he's saying they recognize their obligation. They've benefited from the spiritual blessings that have come through the Jews, and now they owe them to support them materially as their brothers and sisters in Christ. So after I have completed this task and have made sure that they have received this contribution, I will go to Spain and visit you on the way. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the full measure of the blessing of Christ. I urge you, brothers and sisters, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to join me in my struggle by praying to God for me. Pray that I may be kept safe. This is interesting as we trace Paul's life. Um, he wanted to be kept safe, but when he gets back to Rome, he's going to get arrested. So he was hoping for something that didn't happen, but he asked God to pray for it, but he's going to be arrested and eventually wind up in Rome. And be kept safe from the unbelievers in Judea and that the contribution I take to Jerusalem may be favorably received by the Lord's people there so that I may come to you with joy by God's will and in your company be refreshed. The God of peace be with you all. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Now, so let's pull, let's pull apart some of the things that are going on, right? Let's talk about it. So Paul is our author, the Apostle Paul, right? And, and sometime, if, as, if you're studying and you get a, a little study of the book of Romans, uh, you go out and do that, uh, it'd, it'd be good to look at who Paul is, right? Paul is a Jew, and he was a committed Jew to the, as he would say, to the faith of his forefathers, I mean, he was so committed that he was willing to kill people that he felt were misrepresenting it. And Paul was a man truly and literally that had blood on his hands. Okay? We meet him in the Bible. The first time we meet him is where he's an instigator and in facilitating the stoning of the very first New Testament martyr who dies for their faith in Christ, Stephen, in Acts chapter 7. Where's Paul? He's holding the outer cloaks of people so that they can throw their stones better. Right? And Paul was a ringleader. He says it himself. He was going from town to town, ferreting out Jews who believed in this Messiah Jesus and bringing them to justice. Okay? So this is a Paul that when Christ met him on the road to Damascus, and if you want to read about it, you can read about it in Acts chapter 9, and you can read about it in Acts 22 and Acts 26 and Galatians 1 and 1 Timothy 1. You get the impression that Paul never got over that moment. His life was 180. And when Christ addressed him, he said, why are you opposing me? Not why are you attacking my people, why are you opposing me? And Paul was turned, came to Christ by grace. He was rescued, deeply transformed. And then a surprise of all surprise, he took the uber Jew, right? The Jew who was preeminently Jewish, who was willing to kill people that, who hated Gentiles. And he makes him the apostle to whom? To the Gentiles. Paul knows the transforming impact of the grace of God to love your enemies to change your whole perspective. He says that's the power that's unleashed that we as brothers and sisters in Christ should be able to accept one another deeply. Right? So Paul is our author, and we don't have any doubt about those things. So what's going on with him? And these are some of the things that we learn. He's on his third missionary journey, right? Here's a little picture of it. This is the missionary journey that started over up here in Asia Minor, worked its way up into Greece. That's where Thessalonians, Athens, and Philippi are. Worked its way down into Corinth, and it was going to end back in Jerusalem. Well, where Paul is right now is he's in Corinth. He's there writing uh, from Corinth. Almost all scholars think that that's where he's writing from. He spent a good bit of time in Corinth, right? We also know other letters that uh, he wrote to Corinth, right? First and Second Corinthians, but this one he wrote from Corinth, right, to uh, Rome. Now, what's he doing, though, on this? He's taking up a collection. 
And you can read about this in 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9, about the, the detailed uh, things that he's trying to do to guarantee that, that the money is protected, that there's nothing uh, untoward that happens with regards to this collection. And why is he taking up a collection? Because the Jews, the Christian Jews and the Jewish church primarily, there are Gentiles, but the church in Jerusalem, the area is going through a famine. People are starving. And so Paul, right, is going among the other churches, and he said, you can see the thing, he says, every day of the week, every first day of the week, right, when you meet together, take a part of your offering and set it aside so that I can pick it up and bring these resources to your fellow believers in Jerusalem to relieve them in this time of famine. And so they were, they, if, as they were doing this, the Corinthian church had some struggles with it, and so Paul addresses that. But they were collecting it, and Paul was going around to these largely Gentile house churches, and he was taking up a collection to take back to what is like the mother church in Jerusalem. So that's what Paul is doing. Now, for Paul, at the end, I don't know if you caught that, right at the end of chapter 15, he says, pray for me that the Jews in Jerusalem will receive this gift. Okay. Paul not only says that it's the obligation of the Gentiles to give to their Jewish brothers and sisters because they've received spiritual blessings from them, but he's worried that when he gets the gift back to Jerusalem that the Jews are going to stiff arm it. The Jewish Christian is going to say, uh-uh, nope. Why? Because we don't recognize the Gentiles as full members of the people of God. Paul's worried. There's theological things at stake. So to put here, there's a number of things that are going on. This is more than just a collection. This is more than just an activity. This is more than just a charitable outreach, right? It, it, picture, it teaches a number of things. They're, they're doing good to people. And, you know, between Jews and Gentiles, Paul brings us in, if you want to read Philippians chapter 3, right? If you were a Jew, you regularly affectionately referred to Gentiles as kunas, dogs, Okay? And that's nothing good, right? When you call somebody a dog, you're calling somebody that returns to their vomit, right? That kind of thing. And when they referred to Jews, they referred to them, they did a play on the word paraptome, which is circumcision. They did a play on the word, and they said, the Jews are a bunch of katatome, a bunch of mutilators of the flesh. Right? They're just cutting body parts off, right? They're, they're a debauched group of people, right? And so... Just because they, they came to Christ, they had to undo right, generations of hatred, generations of, of dealing with each other as less than human being. Right? And so now they're literally giving to people that, that they may have hated them, may have dismissed them, may have stood off from them, may have hurt them in the past. So they need to love right, those who may have even persecuted them. And second, the oneness of Jews and Gentiles in Christ. Right? This, is, this is picturing in its gift that by Gentiles taking up this money and giving it to these Jewish Christians that we're all one body in Christ. I'm owning you as part of the family. I'm owning my responsibility to you as part of the family. And then the interdependence of Jews and Gentiles. This is one of the things that, that uh, is a stress and strain on every church and every place around the world. Okay? We all wish Paul would have just given up on trying to get the Jews and Gentiles together. I wish he would have just given up and said at the end, you know, we get like Romans 17 and he goes, okay, I've tried to get you Jews and Gentiles together. It ain't working. Jews, you go have your church. Gentiles, you go have yours. And then, you know, once a month get together and have a potluck supper, right? Uh, and at least be nice to each other. Well, he never does that. He says, no, no, God has unleashed a power that enables you to break down the old walls of hostility and to make you one new people. And matter of fact, this is what the Spirit of God is pushing you toward. You're resisting the Spirit if you want to step back into your homogeneous groups, if you want to step back into these little niches that you feel more comfortable with, right? Your identity in Christ needs to make you a new people. Those old things no longer are your primary identity. I don't care what your education is, what your socioeconomic condition is, where you came from, right? So God calls us in Ohio to love people from Michigan. That's really difficult, right? To love them, right? To even say Michigan, right? Uh, all those kind of things like that. God calls us, right, into those areas to love people that used to be 
before they came to Christ, maybe your enemy, somebody that used you. Right? It's happened here at Emmanuel. You're sitting there and somebody comes to a class that you're in and you knew them and in, in your previous life, they hurt you and you knew who they were. And now all of a sudden you see them coming into your family and you're not too excited, right? So the interdependence, Paul says the declaration of the gospel is not only in the proclamation of the words that tell the message, but it's in the body and the body life of the people who have embraced the message. It should be a place where you come here and you're looking at this group of people and you're trying to figure out why would these people even hang together and why would they love each other? And the only way you can explain it is because God did something profound. Right? Okay. Now, so his personal concerns. He's anxious about whether these Jews are going to receive this uh, gift from them, right? Is he going to stiff arm? And you're thinking, well, that's dumb, right? Well, it's, it's, you're going to die for your principles, right? So they're, they're, it's a famine relief, right? It's not like they're, they're sending them money to, you know, put a bench in the narthex or something like that, right? This is famine, famine relief. This is subsistence things. And he's afraid they won't receive it. So Paul's anxious about that, and he's anxious about them believing the truth of the gospel, stepping in in obedience and, and recognizing the Gentiles as full members of the people of God. He's at a ministry crossroads. He's saying, I've done everything as far as I can. I've preached the gospel where it hasn't been preached. Now the next place of ministry for me is Spain. So he's making a transition. He's envisioning future ministry to Spain. He's, he's going to stop by at Rome on the way there. We're going to talk about that. Uh, he's going to stop by at Rome. And he tells them up in front is that I'm coming as a missionary and I'm hoping that you will provide some material resources for me to do my mission. Right? Straight out. Hey, I'm coming. I'm going to minister to you while I'm here, but I'm hoping that you will assist me. And that word that he uses about assist is provide material support to fund my mission to Spain. Right? So this is what he's up to. Now, some important things we need to know about the background of Rome and Roman Christians that help us understand why there is heightened Jew-Gentile tensions. Okay? So here's some things I just want to briefly talk about. So we know, this is interesting too, this church was not established by Paul. Okay, now if you read through Paul, he doesn't talk to all of his churches the same. Uh, for example, if you read 1 Corinthians, uh, he says, you don't have many fathers in the faith. Matter of fact, you don't have any. I am your father in the faith. And you have some guardians, some people who've come alongside. But he speaks to them like a dad. He says at the end of chapter 4, this is probably, I can't ever imagine myself saying this to people at EBC, right? Uh, he says this to the church at Corinth. He says, when I come to visit you, am I going to come and give you a spanking or am I going to come and give you words of commendation? Right? That's how he speaks to them. He doesn't speak that way to the church at Rome. He speaks to a group of people who've already established. It's not directly under his authority. He has to actually establish his authority to address them right at the very beginning. So uh, it was an establishment. It may go back. When did it get started? We don't know, but... When Peter was preaching in Acts chapter 2, there were Jews, Christian, there were Jews from uh, Rome, and very likely those were the earliest converts, so it's been established for a while. But we also know that Christianity had penetrated Rome significantly, and we know this because of secular writings and in the book of Acts chapter 18, but around 49 AD, Claudius was the ruler, and uh, we get this, this is actually a relief of a Roman soldier forcing Jews out of the city of Rome. And what happened, Suetonius, who's a historian, he tells us about it, because the Jews of Rome were indulging in constant riots at the instigation of Crestus, he expelled them from the city. Okay. Now, most scholars, secular and Christian alike, think that Crestus is a Latin transliteration, right, uh, letter for letter, for the Greek word Christos, Christ. And what he's referring to is the same thing that through uh, uh, Christians out of Rome in Acts 18 is Christianity penetrated the Jewish quarter in Rome. 
Jews lived in an area that was prescribed, and so Christianity came in. And what happened? If you read through the book of Acts, the same thing happened in Rome that happened everywhere else. Some Jews embraced it, and many opposed it. You can read about it in Acts 17 in Thessalonica. You can read about it in Acts 19 in Ephesus. Well, what happened is Christianity comes in, right? Christ is introduced as Messiah. Some Jews embrace it, but others don't, and it causes an uproar. Well, if you're a dictator, this is the kind of things you can do. You can say, you guys are just driving me crazy. I ain't got time for that, right? And just throw all the Jews out of Rome. Now, what happens then, and this is interesting when you think about it, it leaves the Gentiles as the predominant force in the Roman Christianity. So they take it over. They take over the churches. Now, one of the things we're going to find is when we read the book of Romans, the Gentiles are sick and tired of the Jews. They see the Jews as legalistic, judgmental, condemnatory. I ain't got no time for you. They're not accepting one another at all. They're not interested in Jew-Gentile relationships. We're going to find that. And they get a, a, a period of time. I, I've joked with this about in, in my classes before. Just if we had in, in, in the city of Columbus, let's just say, for example, that you know, got a mayor there who became you know, uh, the equivalent of a dictator. Uh, and he says you know, that you've got the worship wars happening in the churches around Columbus, right, over traditional worship and people that want more contemporary things, and basically the more contemporary is like 30 and younger, and the more traditional are the older ones. And so he just, he said, I'm tired of this, and he bans everybody 30 and older from the city limits, right? And then finally, the young people get to take over the churches like they've been wanting to for a long time, right? They, they burn the organ as a youth event, right? Because that's pretty cool and exciting, right? They redecorate the auditorium so it looks a little bit uh, 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 mid-century modern, Got some industrial, got to have some piping hanging out somewhere, an exposed brick wall, right? We got to get some things going on. Got to get better coffee, right? Folgers goes out, right? Anathema on Folgers, right? Whatever it is, we got to do these kind of things. All of a sudden, they take it over. And again, it's not that they change theology. They change kind of sensibilities in the way you do keep house and the things that become important to you as a culture. And then all of a sudden, what happens is this edict lapses under Nero. Nero comes to power. It's not formally rescinded, but it lapses as the Jews come back into town. They find out that the church looks really different and the Gentiles don't have any concern about their sensibilities. Right? I mean, this is happening. You, you walk in, if you've gone into a church and it's older and it's established and it's there, you walk in, right? And you recognize there's a lot of unspoken rules in here about who does what and why we do what we do. And then you make this ben, you know, benign recommendation and you find out you just open up Pandora's box, right? And somebody has a heart attack, right? Uh, and you're going, well, okay, well, let's not sing that song then or let's not do that, right? And let's not adjust the, the things along those lines. Well, now you, you have a whole group of people who are coming in with Jewish identity concerns and they have concerns about which day of the week should be honored. They have concerns about what you should eat and not eat. And they're trying to navigate that, and, and it's causing all kinds of tension. So they filled it back in, you got this tension. And so you find it all the way through the book of Romans, right? So Paul's writing then, he's writing from Corinth, right, in about uh, the middle of the 50s AD. Okay, the middle of the 50s, 10 years from now, Paul's going to be martyred, right? But Christianity is, is, is developed here. He's, on the, he's, on his, he's going to go on his return trip soon from Corinth, but he's writing from Corinth, and Phoebe comes and drops off the letter for the church of Rome. And again, this letter, he's going to go back to Jerusalem first, drop off that collection, and then he hopes to go to Rome and then on to Spain. So he's going to give them some time to digest it. <laughs> going to give them some time to read it, some time to reflect on it, right? Uh, anticipating, I'm sure, that he's going to have quite a lively discussion when he gets there. So, he's got trifocals on. Does anybody have trifocals? I didn't know if anybody has those. I, I have bifocals. Oh, okay. The Strongs are strongly representing trifocals today uh, in terms of that. Both of them attest to that. But he's got three things in his vision, right? So, three things that he's looking at. The Roman church. So, he's establishing his credentials, right? He's the apostle, but he's not been with them. People know him who are there. But in one way, you can read this as a missionary saying, I'm going to lay out 
what I believe and what's important. But he's not just doing that just to provide them with a statement of belief. He's laying it out to affect the dynamics in their church. He's trying to edify them, right? Edify is an old term, right? To build up someone in the faith, to encourage them to believe rightly, to live in conjunction with those beliefs, to strengthen them and what, what their understanding of what it means to follow Jesus, okay? And reconcile. He wants to promote reconciliation between Jews and Gentiles. And I want to, Paul speaks bluntly. When we get to chapter 11, he's going to say to the Gentiles, who do you think you are? You were wild olive shoots that were grafted by God's mercy into the natural vine, which is the Jews. And I want to tell you that God still has the Jews in his view, and he's going to return when the deliverer comes, and, and there's going to be a mass conversion of Jews. So he's going to go after them in terms of that. And then he wants to gain them as a base of support. He tells right off, I hope that you'll support me in my mission as I move forward. Now, the Jerusalem church, he wants prayer concerning the reception of the Gentile gift, right? He wants them to receive it, right? You, you guys have known um, the, the dynamic of trying to give somebody help when they, they see the help as something that uh, uh, speaks of them being less than, and so they don't want to take it. No, I don't need your help, right? But at the same time, where it puts them in some sort of a relationship with you that they don't want to acknowledge. No, I don't want your help, right? So one is, I don't want help. I don't need it. And the other one is, I don't want yours, right? You know, sometimes we can do that as husbands and wives, you know, petty and petty things, Right? Like, uh, you just had a fight with your wife, and then you go to open the door with her, right, for her. No, thank you. I can open it for myself. Right? Now, my wife's never said that today, but, you know, those are the kind of things, right? I can open that for myself. I don't need your help. No, put that box down. I can carry it myself. Right? I mean, there's one. I don't need your help, right, or I don't need help. Right? Those are the two kinds of things. And one, to humble, yeah, I do need help. Right? And one of the things we're going to find out, we need each other. And I need different people with different perspectives, different backgrounds and experiences. Why do I know I need that? Because God saved you from those backgrounds and brought you to me. That's all I need to know. He brought you to me. And it brought me to you, right? That's the bad side of it. He brought me to you, right? So I know I need you, and you've been gifted by God. And matter of fact, I'm, I've been empowered by the Spirit to make this group work. So I don't, get, I don't get to say, you know, these people are too hard. Jesus said, no, no, I died to make this possible, and I've empowered you the Spirit to do it. Are you saying I haven't resourced you enough, Greg? Uh, well, I don't want to say that, Jesus. Okay, well, then do it. Right? They, they don't read books. Okay, do it. Or they read books. Do it. Right? The way that, that they like things that I don't like. Okay, fine, they're your brother and sister. Well, can I just choose some that I like better? No, I choose them. Right? You make the family. Right? So that's the idea here. Right? So he wants, he's concerned that they're going to say, I don't, I don't need help or two, I don't need your help. Right? And then third thing, personal ministry. He wants to request prayer. Right? Paul, he illustrates to us, right? He's an apostle. He's got all these things. He's not self-sufficient. He needs help. He's got concerns. He worries about things, right? Paul struggled with, when you get the list in, in, in 2 Corinthians in particular, where Paul, it's in chapter 11, I believe it is, he goes through all the things that he's faced, and he talks about being stoned and beaten and shipwrecked and robbed and everything else. And at the bottom, he says, but to top it all off, the most, most weighty thing is my concern for all the churches, and you can see in his letters, he had to write the Corinthians because they were losing their mind. And he was afraid that they were going to be deceived to follow the evil one. He writes the Galatians because Jews and Gentiles have screwed up the gospel. He writes Ephesians, right, concerned about Jew-Gentile issues and spiritual warfare that they're facing. He writes Philippians because Euodia and Syntyche are at each other's throats. And it's caused a, a major issue that's threatening their witness and their mission. Right, over and over and over again, he has the weight of that. So he asked prayer for himself. He wants God He's asking God, please, God, help them to step inside the truth that you have created them as one new people 
under one Messiah, Jesus, to serve him and that they need to declare your goodness and they need to embrace and trust you with your wisdom to love one another as brothers and sisters. Okay? He prepares them for a visit to support him, right? He's not going to spring himself on there. He wants to get there and he wants to teach them. So here's his thesis in 1, 16 and 17. We'll keep coming back to this over and again because this is kind of chunky here. My time's coming to the end. But in 1, 16 and 17 are the key verses that set up the whole argument of the book of Romans. Okay? And this little phrase, which really comes from the book of Habakkuk, that Paul quotes in 1, 17, the just by faith shall live, is, uh, we, you could, many have broken it up, the first uh, um, Four chapters are how one becomes right with God by faith, and the rest of the book is what it looks like to live out that life by faith. But he's got three major moves, as we've seen. As God's program in Christ is going to be explained in 118 to 839. He's going to defend it in 9 through chapter 11. It should be 9-1, not 9-10. And then he's going to apply it in 12-1 to 16. So if you can think of those three movements, explain it, defend it, apply it for the guidance, growth, protection, and mission effectiveness of the church, Jews and Gentiles united by faith in Christ. Okay? Rich and poor, educated, uneducated, right? Men and women, right? Old and young, united by faith in Christ, on one mission, right? So he wants to guide them in terms of, so I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God for salvation. Everyone who believes first for the Jew, then for the Gentile, for in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as written, the righteous will live by faith. Okay, now this is just a larger one here to think about it. So if you're trying to think of the structure, we're going to be in just the very first one through eight. And the reason why I put a a, a pyramid over here, uh, the only visual thing I want you to get from that, Paul's going to build this huge, absolutely gargantuan theological foundation that he's going to bring to bear on Jew-Gentile tensions at the very end. So one of the things you can take away from that, as we said at the beginning, God, in his work in Christ, by the power of the Spirit, has literally moved heaven and earth to create a new people for himself, who not only declare verbally what he has done for them, but they declare by the way they love one another who he is and what he has done for them. So he's shaping a new people with a mission and a new identity, right? And so that's where we're going to head over the weeks ahead. And you're going to start studying 1, 1 to 7 over these next uh, couple weeks. And then we'll come back and we'll get started in Romans 1, 1 to 7.